It's May 30th, 2018. The Mets are away, but their home stadium, City Field, is heating up. Not because of anything Mets related, the stadium was literally on fire. I want you to think, just for a second, about your perception of the New York Mets baseball team. Odds are, at some point in your life, you've made fun of the Mets. It was very common in pop culture. It was all the franchise was about for at least a decade, possibly their whole history. Yeah, probably more like their whole history. The phrase LOL Mets, or LOL Mets, I'm gonna say LOL Mets because I think it rolls off the tongue better, was everywhere. It symbolized that this team, no matter what they did and no matter how hard they tried, could not escape being seen as a clown show. There was even an ESPN article about how to best understand LOL Mets, but that should all go away. This is not the same organization that put two living men in an in-memoriam segment. This is not the same franchise even Mets fans would relish in cracking jokes about. Because I'm here to tell you today that the Mets, in a matter of about two years, have completely flipped the script. We ended 2020 by producing a near 50 minute video on this channel about how the Mets got here and the comedically tragic organization they became. How about those Mets? Don't start with me and those Mets. I'll spare you from the decades of genuinely insane incidents that define this team both on and off the field. To open 2023, it's time for the complete opposite. And before you even say a word, I'll acknowledge the Edwin Diaz situation. Superstar Mets closer Edwin Diaz did in fact blow his knee out celebrating a win in the World Baseball Classic. Celebrating, not pitching. Yes, the Mets are cursed, and lol Mets takes reared their ugly heads on social media again, completely avoiding the fact that this sort of thing has long played teams who are not the Mets. I'd actually argue the Diaz injury proves the point a little more. Because when Diaz got hurt, and it came out that he'd most likely miss all of the 2023 season, they told him something to the effect of, we're gonna do everything we can to get you better and take care of you and provided him with a trainer, a chef, and a nutritionist. That's the perfect way to transition into the three men who I'm gonna use as the vehicle to show you these new Mets. Three guys at the helm of the transition from memes to dreams. They're the three who symbolize the new look, serious championship contending New York Mets. So for now, the focus will be on them to represent the core of Lowell Mets being dead. The first is the man who signed off on this new care plan for Diaz and tons of other huge additions and improvements to the Mets brand. Meet Steve Cohen. Steve Cohen has a lot of money. He has a lot of cool, expensive possessions. This even extends into his lifelong Mets fandom. So when a super rich, lifelong Mets fan bought the team for the highest price anyone had ever paid for an MLB organization, that should have been a dead giveaway that the team would be in good hands. Steve has spent a lot of money on the Mets, more money than the average person could even comprehend. The most noticeable place that went into was players, as the Mets have committed more money to players this season than any other baseball team ever. Commitment is the big word that I can use to describe Steve's behavior and habits in building the organization up. People noticed that from day one. His introductory press conference basically convinced Marcus Stroman to accept the qualifying offer to stay in Queens before hitting the open market again. And in a world where many MLB owners are cutting their team payrolls at the expense of team quality and fan enjoyment, Cohen has been doing the exact opposite and has objectively made his team put out a better on-field product, and has helped baseball in the process. They're also doing a really good job at appealing to a lot of different groups. They're unveiling a new club in the stadium that costs many thousands of dollars to get a seat in, while also announcing a plan to offer $15 tickets to college students. Get yourself a guy that can do both. It's like if you had the same guy own and operate Dorcia from American Psycho while also implementing a Bernie Sanders-like policy that benefits young people. If you hate the Mets because they spend a lot of money, you are misguided. As a fan, you should want to see your team invest in itself like the Mets have. And if the Cohen Mets do win a championship, it should inspire your favorite team to do the same. Steve's goal is exactly that too, winning. He understands that it takes a whole lot more than a couple of bucks and some solid players to achieve that. 
When Mets All-Star Jeff McNeil chose to sign an extension to stay with the team for four more years, he said the decision started with ownership and how much he wanted to be a part of the new energy and culture that's been growing under Cohen's watch. But again, Cohen's money has gone into a lot more than just the roster. He's been putting together a plan and consulting the local community on how to best develop the area surrounding City Field. Team employees saw significant pay raises. The history of the franchise has been honored and preserved through many Cohen-led events. A special lounge for the players' loved ones. A sensory nook on the concourse at the stadium to help fans with special needs have a place to detox from all the stimulation that comes with live baseball. Farm system support, facility upgrades, if you haven't picked up yet that ownership spending and investment is way more than player contracts, then what more do the Mets have to do for you? And yes, the scoreboard you can probably see from Mars. An organization that's a total joke doesn't do these things. The Yankees don't even provide their players free in-flight Wi-Fi. Now, an organization that's a joke might force its star players to play injured not completely surpass the expectations of players who think they'd fallen into the Mets' mess again. But still, a big domino that had to fall was winning over the players. There needed to be a leader to help shape and execute a positive culture in the organization. A player who could be the conduit of everything Steve and the Mets want to accomplish. It's time to talk about Francisco Lindor. And Lindor drives this one down the left field line toward the pole! Home run! Francisco Lindor with a two-run homer to put the Mets in front! Steve Cohen's first huge move as Mets owner was to make a trade to bring in Francisco Lindor as the team's centerpiece. And on the eve of opening day 2021, signed him to a 10-year, $341 million contract extension. For the next decade, Lindor would be tasked with being the on-field face of the New York Mets. Or, when Steve has the idea to invest in a Mets Super Bowl commercial to continue to grow the team's brand off of it, a face there too. Now you hang up. Lindor and Steve have a great relationship. The two have weekly meetings, and when Lindor crushed his finger inside of a hotel room in LA before a game with the Dodgers, Steve felt comfortable enough to tease him on Twitter about it. You lose all the time, you're used to this. But even so, there was a lot of room to grow from when Lindor joined the Mets to where they are today. Even after his first year with them in 2021, Lindor felt that they were an unprofessional organization. Some of the remnants of the old Metsiness from before Cohen took over not totally being kicked out yet, occasionally even consuming Lindor himself. Today, far from that. Far from it. That's kind of what I just said, Howard Hamlin. Lindor's very open about wanting to continue to build a winning culture with the Mets, and even after a first round exit in the playoffs in 2022, thinks they can only use that to get better. He's very encouraged by everything the Mets brass have been doing, often speaks about the respect and belief he has in just about everyone in the organization. That includes his longtime confidant and Mets legend Carlos Beltran, who's back with the organization after a incident that kept him from ever being the Mets manager on the field. But Lindor is a leader, he holds his teammates accountable, and he is proud to be the face of the New York Mets. You rarely see players so proud to be a part of their team that they openly talk about how much they enjoy wearing their own team's gear in public, but Lindor does just that. This pride and love for the Mets extends into Lindor's family too, specifically his two-year-old daughter. After the Mets' only postseason win this past season, Lindor's daughter stole the show by calling for one man, not her father, the Mets manager. Hey man, if Lindor's two-year-old daughter loves the Mets manager that much, that probably means Lindor loves it here, and that the manager does a pretty good job. So what's the manager's name? Buck. Buck Showalter is a baseball lifer. We touched on that during our mid-season stream last summer. My man's was in Seinfeld skits when Keith Hernandez was, like just after his career ended. <laughs> and since you had your famous conversation with uh, Mr. Costanza, was wondering if uh, there's any thought to uh, bringing back the cotton uniforms. We won't be wearing cotton uniforms. Buck had a reputation in baseball for many years before he got the Mets job. They called him a control freak. It was widely known that Buck was the kind of guy who both wanted a ton of control and was very my way or the highway during his first four MLB managing jobs. But in my house, my family knew him as the guy insane enough to wear a full-on jacket during 105 degree weather in Arizona 
But during his three years out of baseball, he changed. He evolved. I mean this respectfully, he was an old dog who learned new tricks. Players constantly attribute the Mets' culture change to Buck. He's viewed as much more of a collaborative people person, posting the names and faces of many team employees and media members in the clubhouse so the players can recognize the human beings they interact with. He still does have the mindset to have things his way, but only in very select and appropriate spots. Buck's very big on having obscure rule lessons with his players, something that near single-handedly earned the Mets a run during a game against the Diamondbacks last season, even if it did crush my soul to see Oliver Perez get victimized by it. Buck seems to have placed a greater emphasis on getting the players what they want, in tandem with his own abilities to get what he wants. In that sense, he's tough, but he's fair. Mets players used to get upset that the broadcasters would be willing to criticize the team on the air. Buck thought that was stupid, put his foot down, and insisted they weren't the enemy. That does not mean whatsoever that he doesn't advocate for the players. When the Mets broke the MLB record for most times hit by a pitch in a season last year, he'd get pissed off for them. Every time. All this new culture, mixed with the winning, has really shaped Buck's picture of the Mets. He believes in his players, he works very well with the front office and Steve Cohen, and he truly does appreciate Steve Cohen. But what's representative of these new Mets is how Buck talks about them. Buck's first big job was manager of the Yankees, where he would meet Mr. George Costanza. He managed the Yankees through some quality baseball. He's seen them be a good team. The general public has always perceived the Mets as the little brother to the Yankees in New York. Buck doesn't. We're not the little brother of anyone, Buck asserts. Reminder, a man who has personally been at the helm for winning Yankees baseball and came up as a coach through the Yankees organization. It is way more than just the contributions of these three men that have made the Mets what they are today, but these three symbolize the changing of the guard. They are the ones who best represent the new New York Mets. The vibes are different here, so I went in to see them myself. I've neglected to actually mention to this point that I grew up a lifelong Mets fan. Following this culture growth and transition for the past two years has been phenomenal and such a quick yet drastic turnaround. Pick your favorite wacky Mets moment of the last few years before that. There was barely a peep of Mets dysfunction in 2022. I've gone down to see the team in spring training more times than I can count, and getting my taste of spring training this year really showed me how different the culture is. If you don't believe that I went, you can see my dad's car in the background of one of the Shea Station PPPs when I rode up with him to camp one Friday afternoon. No, seriously, look. The spring training facility has now been branded as City Field South, which is brand new. It feels more grand down here now, a lot closer to like a Disney World-ish kind of feel than it was five or ten years ago. I'm walking around yesterday, I feel I mean, an incredible vibe here. I think this is the best vibe I felt and since I, you know, started this. I think the Mets are gonna go all the way this year. The fans have been showing out and cheering a lot during mid-March spring training games. And there's a crazy overlap of a lot of fun and an all about business vibe here. Players are grinding, but also dancing. There's championship expectations, but also games of guess the Mets. Players who'd bounced around a little bit, openly talking about how much they loved coming to the Mets and how easy it was to fit in and be comfortable on the team. This stuff matters, and it contributes to a positive energy fans can feel. I talked to Mets beat writer Anthony DeComo about this, and he did confirm that this is a group that knows it's got a real shot to win a championship. So they're both letting loose and having fun, while also taking themselves seriously enough to get it done. That's special. Heck, even when my friends and I ran into new Mets pitcher Jose Quintana at a restaurant, Quintana told us he was feeling good, despite an injury we two hours later found out will probably keep him out for three plus months. I believe him in hindsight. He was still very kind and in good spirits, so even if his rib was most definitely not feeling good, he could have possibly been talking about that from a mental health point of view. After all, a guy who absolutely knew that diagnosis already would have had every reason to be standoffish and blunt with us, but he wasn't. The good spirits are up in Mets land from everyone involved. This is an organization that has become one of the best brands in baseball, on and off the field. They're building something, and if you think this is the same clown show they'd been, you're wrong. For what it's worth, the good vibes are infectious around the Mets right now.
you know, that reminded me of, um, what's his face, Nardwar, where, he, you oh. know, like, he's just, and you are? You, you actually just did a really good Nardwar voice. How, how did you know that? You're Wardy and Wham, we have to know. And <laughs> you know? <laughs> Wardy and Wham. Oh, I have this gift for you. <laughs> Keep on rocking in the free world. <laughs> <laughs>